old kits any good? That's the question I'll try to answer in this full build video of Ravel's venerable 148th EA6 Intruder. I got to thinking after seeing some of the negative comments about Airfix's great little 148th P51 Mustang in my last video that maybe us modelers have gotten a bit spoiled with some of the state-of-the-art kits out there today. Not only that, I wondered if some of the it's got to be perfect mindset has had a negative effect on some modelers, causing them to get frustrated or give up on building models like they used to. I also got to thinking that maybe we've lost some of the joy of model building that we used to have when we were kids and didn't know how to count rivets or calculate scale length. So I thought I'd build a blast from the past and try to show that even old models can be really fun and really good kits. Thanks for joining me back here on the Flying S Models channel. Ravel's 148th Intruder was released about 35 years ago and was state-of-the-art at the time. I picked this kit up as a bag kit online for just a few bucks, so let's hope it's got all the pieces necessary to complete the build. Because it's a bag kit, I'll just show a few of the kit parts. The kit features fine raised panel lines and overall really nice details considering its age. The cockpit tub shows the excellent detail that is found on all of the cockpit parts. The first step in the assembly process is to build the ejection seat backs. They're a little fiddly, so just take your time getting all the parts aligned. I used Tamiya Superfine Cement to glue these parts together. You can find a link to the cement, along with other products used on this video build, in the description below. I really like the detail on the seats, the cushions, and the harnesses. The seat backs fit down into the cockpit tub, which has the lower seat cushion molded in. I like to prime all the cockpit parts with a little Tamiya flat black. This provides a dark base that helps with the overall weathering process. I just spray it rather liberally on all of the cockpit parts, including the seat backs, the tub, cockpit sidewalls, and instrument panel. Next, I come back in and airbrush a light coat of Tamiya Neutral Gray on all of the cockpit parts. I realized the A6 cockpit wasn't actually neutral gray, but with all the effects that I will be applying, it's a good base color. Here's a look at all of the parts after the gray is laid down. For the ejection seat cushions, I first used Tamiya Olive Green to lay down a base color. I come back in with a little bit of Tamiya Khaki and spray a light coat over the Olive Green. To start the weathering process, I mix up an oil wash using a little lamp black and raw umber thinned with mineral spirits. This is washed onto the kit parts. You can see how the wash runs into all of the recesses to put a little dirt in the ditches as I like to call it. It looks a little messy at this point, but in some future steps, we'll pull everything together. While the oil wash dries, I jump over to the wings and assemble the top and bottom halves using more of that Tamiya Superfine cement. Despite the kit's age, the overall fit of the parts is really quite good. The oil wash in the cockpit parts takes a while to dry, so I went ahead and used the time to spray the wheel well areas with Tamiya White. With the oil wash dry, I come back in with Tamiya Light Gray and spray a thin coat on the high spots, avoiding the edges and recesses where the oil wash had collected. You can see that the cockpit parts are starting to have a little more depth now. To add more dimension and weathering, I use oil paints applied right from the tube over a coat of white spirits. You can see a more detailed description of this technique in the weathering with oils video I have loaded up here on the channel. After laying down a layer of white spirits, I apply a raw umber to various recessed areas on the cockpit parts using a fine tip brush. I come back right after that and using more clean white spirits and a clean brush, I blend and remove the raw umber into and from the acrylic paint layer. You can remove as much or as little as you like in order to achieve the desired results you're after. Just wipe off the excess on a clean paper towel, dip your brush back in the clean white spirits, and continue the process. I 
I use the raw umber to create some darker shadows and grime effects and then come back in with some white oil paint to add some highlights. I apply a few drops of white to various areas to create a highlighting effect. I repeat the same process I use for the raw umber, blending and removing the white paints until I'm satisfied with the overall look. To add detail to the ejection seats, I first dry brush a little Vallejo khaki onto the seat parts. I remove almost all of the paint from the brush and then gently go over the raised detail on the seat to start to highlight all of the nice raised effects. It's really subtle at this point, and in the next steps, I'll start the detail painting process to really bring all of the seat and cockpit details to life. I mix up a little light green using Vallejo paints and with a fine tip brush, paint the edge trim on each of the ejection seats. Next, I paint the top of the seat cushions with different shades of khaki. I continue highlighting all of the various details on the kit seats using various shades of Alejo acrylics. To bring a little extra contrast, I run a fine tip brush in between each seat cushion section and along the outer edges of the harnesses and other seat features. I use the same detail painting process with various shades of gray, black, and white to paint the rear cockpit section details. I decided I'd better check the fit of the cockpit tub into the fuselage to make sure there weren't going to be any surprises. Overall, the fit is really good. I pulled the tub back out and painted each individual cockpit instrument and switch bank with flat black, and then highlighted each of the switches with either gray, white, or yellow. Here's what the cockpit looked like when I had completed the detail painting and weathering steps. Next, I painted the instrument panel combing and instrument panel by first giving everything a coat of Tamiya flat black. I checked the fit of the combing to the fuselage to make sure that everything was going to be able to go together as planned. Just like I had done with the cockpit consoles, I used Vallejo paints to paint the raised details on the instrument panel. I then added drops of 5-minute epoxy to the various gauges to simulate the glass bezels. With all of the cockpit components painted, I was ready to get them installed into the fuselage and close everything up. Here's a quick look at each of the kit cockpit components before they were installed into the fuselage. The cockpit tub sits in place on top of a couple locating tabs on the right fuselage half. I glued the tub in place with a little Tamiya cement. I then joined the right and left fuse halves together using more cement. Everything was held in place with some masking tape to ensure good alignment of the parts as well as alignment of the raised panel lines. There were a few spots that were going to need to be sanded, so to protect those raised panel lines, I masked them off with Tamiya low tack tape. I used my 400 grit sanding pad to sand those areas smooth. In a few cases, there were some gaps or blemishes that had to be filled. I again taped off the panel lines and used Tamiya fine putty and a small piece of scrap evergreen sheet to fill those in. Ravel was pretty proud of their kits in the 80s, so proud that they marked their brand and date on the tail surfaces. That was easily sanded smooth using that 400 grit sanding pad. While I waited for the Tamiya putty to dry, I jumped back over to the wheels and landing gear parts and airbrushed those with Tamiya's gloss white. I then mixed up an oil wash using raw umber and black, then with mineral spirits and added that to all the wheels and landing gear components. When the wash had dried, I wiped away the excess using a clean paper towel. I used the same detail painting techniques that I'd used for the cockpit to highlight some of the details within the nose gear sidewalls. 
I glued the left and right nose gear walls to the belly closeout piece and then installed that to the completed fuselage assembly. The arrestor hook section snaps into place and then I glued it with more Tamiya cement. While I was waiting for the fuselage pieces to set up, I decided to finish up the wheels by first painting the inner portions of the tires around the wheels using Vallejo Flat Black. I inserted a toothpick into the hole for the axle to allow me to turn and manipulate the wheel, making it a little easier to paint. To finish off the outer portions of the tire, I simply sprayed the Mia Flat Black and then came back with a lighter coat of NATO Black and airbrushed that onto the treads. Now that the putty on the fuselage seams had dried, I sanded those areas down with various grits of fine sandpaper to get a smooth finish. One of the downfalls of buying used kits is sometimes they are missing a few components. In my case, this included a fuselage intake and dorsal antenna. I reworked an intake from an old 148th monogram F8 Crusader and scratch built the new antenna using sheet styrene. These were then installed to the appropriate locations onto the fuselage. Now that I had the fuselage assembly complete, I could mask off the intake and main gear bay areas and start to get some paint down. I decided to do a lazy man's black basing by spraying a splotchy coat of Tamiya Flat Black over all of the surfaces. I followed this up with a coat of Tamiya Gloss White on the under surfaces building it up a little at a time. Since Tamiya doesn't offer a straight up light gold gray, I mixed up a custom blend using white, sky gray, and a little medium gray. I sprayed this mixture on all of the topside areas. I made sure to keep the spray pattern a little splotchy to allow some of the black to come through and provide a little contrast along some of the panel lines. I continued in this way until the entire fuselage had been painted. To start to add a little more contrast, I lightened the gold gray with a few drops of white and thinned it down with extra Tamiya acrylic thinner. This mixture was then sprayed inside of the various panels to create some depth and dimension to the overall finish. Here's how things looked at that point in the build process. The anti-glare panel on the version I wanted to build was dark gray, so I masked off that area with Tamiya low tack tape and sprayed it with Tamiya neutral gray. To make the radome tan, I mixed up Tamiya white, buff, and flesh, and then masked and sprayed the nose radome area. I lightened that mixture up with a little more white and sprayed another light coat around the top and tip of the nose just for a little subtle contrast. The tail was masked and sprayed to crisp up the black vertical stabilizer and white rudder. Here's a look at the fuselage after painting but before adding some oil weathering effects. As I had done in the cockpit and on other previous models, I used oil paints applied over a coat of white spirits laid down directly over the acrylic paint. I started off with raw umber and applied that over white spirits to various panels and rivet areas. I don't really allow it to sit more than a minute or two before I come back in with a clean brush and clean white spirits and blend and remove it from the model surface. I constantly blend and wipe away the oil paint, removing excess using a clean paper towel. You can see the overall effect as it starts to take shape. I work in sections, first applying and removing the darker shades before doing the same thing with the lighter shades. In this case, I use white for the lighter shade. Since I'm working in sections, I didn't need to recoat the model with fresh white spirits before applying the small drops of white to the various panel areas. 
I blend and remove the white in the same way as I had done with the raw umber. The great thing about this technique is that you can use a variety of colors to create some really nice weathering effects. You can see how it starts to really add some interesting dimension to the overall finish. I continue this process working section by section until the entire fuselage is finished. You can focus this technique on specific areas or you can apply it more globally over the entire model as you choose. I masked and sprayed the speed brake areas with Tamiya Flat Red and added an oil wash to bring out the nice details in those areas. Before I permanently installed the instrument combing, I mixed up some 5-minute epoxy and added some brass balls to the mixture. I then dropped those into the nose section to make sure I didn't end up with a tail sitter. I then fitted the instrument combing and glued it in place over the instrument panel. Here's a look at the completed fuselage assembly. Now it was time to get those wings painted and installed. I painted the wings in the same way as I had done with the fuselage, first adding a base coat of flat black and then gloss white for the undersurfaces and upper flap areas. I masked off the upper surfaces of the flaps and then painted the rest of the wing in that light gold gray mixture. I used the same weathering techniques to finish out the wings. Before installing them to the fuselage, I masked and sprayed the wing walk areas with Tamiya Neutral Gray. I had test fitted the wings to the fuselage earlier so I could see that the fit was going to be decent. This is what gave me confidence that I could airbrush and weather them separate from the fuselage and install them later. I plugged the wing tabs into the fuselage insert slots and glued everything in with more of that Tamiya cement. With the main parts assembled, I clear coated everything using AK's Real Gauzy. Once dry, I used AK's decal setting solution to apply all of the various decals. I put a little down before applying each decal and then add a little on top to help each decal settle down to the model's surface. While the decals were setting up, I took time to paint, weather, and build up the main and nose gear assemblies. These were installed on the model along with the gear doors and actuators. While the gear dried, I masked off the windscreen and main canopy section and airbrushed each of those with a coat of Tamiya Flat Black. I painted and installed the speed brakes and then removed the masks from the windscreen and canopy. These were then installed onto the fuselage. The fuel tanks and jamming pods were painted and weathered in the same way as I had done with the fuselage and wings. They were then installed as well as all the other little fiddly bits including the ID and formation lights, as well as the small antennas. Here's a look at the finished model. I decided to build this old kit for two reasons. One, I thought it would be fun to kind of connect to the modeling experiences I had had when I was a kid. And two, after hearing criticism of some of the newer kits out there, I began to think that maybe we modelers had gotten a bit spoiled and have forgotten how much fun building a model can be when we weren't so focused on counting rivets or nitpicking to the point where we didn't want to build it because it wasn't good enough. While the Ravel Intruder is about 36 years old, it's still a great kit, and it's a lot of fun to build. I was able to get this one super cheap by buying it secondhand through an online model kit trading forum. We all build models for various reasons, and I made this video in part as an encouragement to do just that. Spend time building a model rather than focusing on the reasons why not to build it. Once again, I appreciate you tuning back into the Flying S Models channel, and I hope that you found this video informative, encouraging, and maybe even a little fun. Make sure to subscribe and click the notifications bell to keep up with my latest video updates. We'll see you next time.